Okay, we're now recording. So welcome to Anna Craft and Melody Rood, who can enter, I'm sure they're going to introduce their titles from UNCG Libraries. And today they're going to talk about open access OA uh, versus open educational resources OER. Um, and uh, go through that as their slide. Show. What's the difference? Why does it matter? What support is there? So thanks, Anna and Melody. Thanks, Sam. Sorry, that was a little slow loading. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We're really glad that Sam is running this Winter Professional Development Series. And we've got a Go link here at the bottom of the slides if y'all would like to follow along or consult these in the future. Go.uncg.edu slash OAOER 2021. And this is us. I'm Anna Craft. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm the coordinator of scholarly communication here in the libraries. Hello, and I'm Melody Rood, she, her pronouns, and I'm the student success and open education librarian. So we're really glad to be here to talk to y'all today about OA and OER and what those things mean and how we can help. Um, and if you've got questions, like Sam said, feel free to enter them in the chat as we're going through the talk or uh, save them till the end, and we would be glad to answer them then too. So today we're going to briefly talk about what open access and open educational resources are, what those things mean. We will talk about how they can support you and your students in research, teaching, learning, and student success. We'll talk about OA and OER services and support from the libraries, and of course we will answer questions. So open access, we'll talk about this first. What is this and why? So open access is a publishing model, but it's also a method for sharing scholarship. It can be both of these things. So when materials are published or shared through open access, they're made available online and anyone can access them with no cost, no sign-ins, no other barriers. So they're openly available to anyone. This is the opposite of closed access, which is the more traditional model for sharing scholarship. In closed access, content is behind a paywall. It requires a subscription. Sometimes that's an institution like a library that's paying for it. Sometimes it might be an individual. Closed access also has other names, subscription-based, toll access, reader pays, or traditional publishing. So you could hear it referred to as any of those names. And lots of different content can be shared through open access. The types that we talk about most commonly are journals and journal articles, but you can share data sets, books, pretty much any type of research output can be shared through open access. What can you do with these materials? You can read them, learn from them, share them and cite them, all of these things at no cost. But there are things that you can't do, there are limitations. So you can't edit or otherwise change these materials or reuse that content in your own work without explicit permission from the copyright holder. Why is open access important? It accelerates discovery because people can find and access that content. It enriches the public and it improves education because these materials are available to everyone. There are some misconceptions about open access. And some of these things can be true sometimes, but they aren't true necessarily across the board. So open access being pay to play, meaning anyone could get anything published just by paying for it. That's not necessarily true. And we'll talk about each of these in more detail on the following slides. Um, with the payment part, publishing in some open access journals does involve article processing charges or APCs, but this doesn't mean that necessarily anyone can just pay to get anything published. There are unfortunately predatory journals out there that do practice that model, but usually open access journals are following the same kinds of rigorous peer review standards, or at least good journals are following those same kinds of peer review standards and then publishing things that would be of the same kind of quality that would be published in closed journals. The funding model is just different. With copyright, many open journals have authors retain that copyright, but you wanna make sure to look for the journal's copyright policy. So be clear on what their policy is before you submit your work. With peer review, legitimate scholarly journals that are open maintain peer review standards that are comparable to closed or non-OA journals. 
again, look for that journal's peer review policy. And if you've got questions, ask the journal or ask a librarian. And with indexing, so indexing makes content more discoverable, more findable. It includes getting journals and their content into, into indexes like Google Scholar or EBSCO or ProQuest or things like that. Many open journals are indexed in major scholarly academic indexes, but the journal should be transparent about where it is indexed and how widely its content is available. Indexing is important because it helps your, your content be found and read and cited. So the primary difference between open access and traditional or closed scholarship, I've mentioned it a couple of times, it really comes down to money. The bills are not being paid by readers in open scholarship, so they don't function as access barriers. Open access removes the paywalls that stand between readers and content. Here's an example of a paywall I, I ran into recently. And I had the option to purchase an article for about $50 or an issue for about $200. And this can really add up. Not all scholars can afford to pay these amounts to get access to the content they need. So with open publishing, scholars don't run into these paywalls. What else can open access do? So there's a growing body of literature that shows that articles that are made available through open access tend to have higher citation counts than those that are published via closed or toll access. And this has been shown commonly enough that it's gotten a name, which is the open access citation advantage. This slide has a couple of values that studies have calculated within the last few years of the uh, amount, uh, the percentage that open articles are showing in terms of higher citations over closed articles. So you see a lot of variance here, eight, 19, 40%, a lot of difference. There's not consensus about the exact percentage that you could expect in terms of higher citations. There can be a lot of factors here, disciplinary and other things that may be affecting those citation numbers. But studies are repeatedly showing that there is an advantage to publishing openly. But this is part of academic freedom. You as a scholar get to decide where you want your work to go. So you get to decide uh, if you wanna publish openly or in a closed journal. And now Melody is going to talk about OER. Thank you, Anna. So you can go to the next slide, please. So what are open educational resources? Um, so if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, so this is defined by BC Campus, which is the University of British Columbia, which has a really robust OER program um, and repository as well but um, it defines it as teaching resources that have an open copyright license, Creative Commons, which I'll be talking about in a second, um, or they reside in the public domain. So depending on the license use, OER can be freely accessed, used, remixed, improved, and shared. Um, so what do some of these terms mean? Copyright, public domain, Creative Commons. So I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you now that these things are sort of within my wheelhouse uh, in terms of um, uh, research interests and knowledge based on uh, OER, but by no means am I uh, a copyright lawyer or expert. But, you know, briefly, uh, this definition of copyright um, sort of uh, can help you understand sort of the difference between that Creative Commons and public domains. And that is that copyright is uh, a type of intellectual property that protects original works in a fixed form. Um, so this is kind of important to, to remember. So if you have, you know, a poem that you're thinking about writing and you have, uh, you know, uh, you even have some lines in your head and you just haven't like written them down yet, that is not uh, copyright protected. It's still in your mind. It's not in a fixed form. But as soon as you write that poem down, you type it out, uh, anything where it can be perceived by others, uh, that is a fixed form. And it's important to remember that copyright is also automatic. So anything that's original and that you put in a fixed form, it is automatically copyrighted to you. You don't have to go and uh, get it registered for it to be copyright protected, although some people choose to do that for extra protections. So that is copyright. So public domain and CC0, these are both referring to the public domain, 
uh, but they're a little different. So um, public domain is works that have no exclusive intellectual property rights. That means nobody owns it, anybody can use it and do with, you know, whatever they want with it. Um, and CC0 is also public domain as well, but it indicates that the author has dedicated their work to the public domain. So something that entered the public domain because their copyright uh, expired can't have a CC0. That was just a natural uh, way that it entered the public domain. So something that already exists in the public domain can't be dedicated to the public domain. It is a choice of the author. So that's the only difference, but they both refer to the public domain. And then Creative Commons licenses. So Creative Commons are um, a type of copyrighted license that gives uh, various permissions on how a work can be reused. So it basically answers the question, what am I allowed to do with this work as somebody who wants to take it, make a copy of it, and then use it in some way? So um, uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Yeah, so just, just to sort of think about it on a scale here, Creative Commons, um, sort of fits somewhere between copyright and public domain. And depending on the license, um, you know, it's going to determine where on that scale it is. You know, if it's closer to a, a traditional copyright or if it's, uh, you know, a CC0 and it's basically in the public domain. So depending on where that is, um, CC is basically, uh, you know, some rights are reserved. So what are those rights? Um, Next slide, please. So this is, you know, quickly uh, just uh, what the CC uh, licenses are. So this is what they look like. You might have seen them on, um, you know, websites, slideshows, or various things that you've looked at before. Um, so from the top left, we have the most open. And then from the uh, bottom right, we have the least open. So this is important because CC licenses are basically what make OER OER. Um, in addition to public domain. So it doesn't include the CC0, but from the top left, we have CC BY. And this basically means you can make a copy of the work and then do whatever you want with the work, um, but you have to attribute me. So you can change things about it. You can translate it if you want to. You can add things to it, take things out. You can even sell it if you want to, your, you know, your copy of it um, and make money off of it or do whatever you want. And then it goes on into uh, the least open. So I'm not gonna explain all of these individually, but I will explain what each symbol means. So on the next one, right underneath the CC BY, we have one that says SA, and that is share alike. And basically what that means is that um, you have to, if you make a copy of the work, um, and depending on what you do with it, uh, you have to then, if you decide to share the work to public audiences, you have to use the same exact license that the original author of the work used. Um, Non-commercial just means that the original author uh, is okay with you, um, you, you know, reusing the work and depending on the other, you know, uh, licenses that are involved, um, you know, you can maybe uh, uh, change it, but they don't want you to make any um, money off of it. You can't use it for commercial purposes. And then the no derivatives is the least open, and it essentially means you cannot change the work. You can make a copy of, it, of the work, you can retain the work, and you can redistribute the work for free, but you cannot change any of the original content. Um, it has to be verbatim. So if you would go to the next slide for me. So this is sort of what it looks like. I know this is a lot of uh, symbols here, but if you think of the green area in this image where it, there's the um, mark through C, that is the public domain. And then uh, down at the bottom, we have the copyright. And so we have the, the most open to least open, and you can see where each of these fall from that. And I'm not gonna read all of these, but each one, you know, it tells you exactly what you can do with it as a reuser, and that's what Creative Commons does. So, for example, um, a CC by non-commercial means you can copy it, you can retain it, you can build upon or edit the work, um, and you can distribute it with credit, but you cannot use the work uh, commercially. Um, so, those are just some examples. 
And so this is important because the uh, it coincides with what OER is and the five R's of OER. So this is what makes up open educational resources. Um, it's the ability to retain a copy of the work, to redistribute the work, to revise the work, edit it, modify it, um, to remix the work so you can uh, combine um, different open source, openly source things and uh, create a new source um, or just, you know, reuse it in a different context. So the five R's of OER, um, you know, it, depending on who you talk to, some people will say that uh, it's only OER if it has all five R's, but other folks um, recognize that, you know, uh, some things might have certain license, Creative Commons licenses, and still be considered OER. It kind of just depends on who you talk to. Um, but I do want to point out, though, that open educational resources are often thought of as textbooks, open textbooks, but that's not always the case. They can be anything that has the uh, Creative Commons licenses and that tries to, um, you know, use these five R's. So if you don't mind going to the next slide, Anna. So this is just a couple of examples where you might see it. Sometimes it is in that sort of logo form. And then other times you just see sort of the symbols and then the CC by and then whatever follows it. So the screenshot to the right is from OER Commons, which is a really popular um, OER repository. And you can see that the, um, the license for the first one is a CC by um, non-commercial share alike. So if you want to use this resource and change it in any way, you can actually do that. But if you were to share that resource, you can't charge anyone money for it and you have to use the same exact uh, license that they used. And then underneath it, we have a very open one, which is the, just the CC BY. You can use it um, and you just have to attribute the author. Um, we have that again with OpenStax, uh, a screenshot from OpenStax. You can see that it has the, um, sort of logo there and similar to what I just showed you. And then below is an image uh, called, uh, it's from a database called Images of Empowerment that has uh, openly sourced images that you know, show um, uh, diverse women. And there is a CC by non-commercial uh, that's just sort of mentioned in the description of the image. So it can come in many different forms. You, you kind of just have to know to look out for it. So next slide, please. And then this is an example just from um, a slideshow uh, that I created from a workshop that I did last year. And you can see at the bottom, there's a CC BY. Uh, it says what it is, who created it, and it's licensed under um, the CC BY. Uh, international, which means that I'm okay with anybody taking the slides and um, changing up some of the content, retaining it, and doing whatever they want with it. So why do we use OER? So now that we sort of understand what makes OER OER, and that's the Creative Commons licenses, um, why, why would we want to use it? So uh, the um, University of Florida does this giant study with over 21,000 participants, and they, they update it every couple of years, but uh, they, they publish this survey that basically looks at how the cost of textbooks, and again, this is specifically looking at like textbooks or maybe like access codes, other educational things, but um, how that might impact students. And these numbers have consistently stayed the same for um, since I believe 2016. And the most recent update of these, the, the numbers haven't changed that much. So what they found is that 64% of students just did not purchase the textbook. If the textbook was too expensive um, for the class, they just didn't buy it, which we can you know, all agree that is an immediate student success issue. That means they don't have access to the information that they need to succeed in the class. 43% um, of students took fewer courses. Um, this can impact the trajectory of their um, graduation date if they need to take certain courses at certain times. Um, that can affect that, um, and that can, you know, add more cost to them if they have to stay on for an extra semester or take a summer semester. 40% um, of students did not register for a specific course. Again, that can uh, impact um, their graduation, their uh, graduation trajectory. 
uh, 36% of students earned a poor grade and 23% of students dropped a course. So this is a major student success issue. Um, and I think that it's no surprise that students have a very hard time paying for books when uh, universities are telling them to uh, plan to spend about $1,000 per semester um, on their textbooks, which is a lot of money. And sometimes, you know, they are waiting for their uh, refund checks to come back to pay for that. But if they don't come back in time, that's a couple of months where students might not have the textbook or resources they need for the class. And you can see from this um, chart here from the uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics that um, the, uh, the rate of textbook textbooks have increased over 800% since the mid 70s. Um, and this number is actually higher. You can see it kind of only goes up to like 2011 or 12. Um, it, it's higher now, but it's just goes to show how, uh, how much textbooks have increased um, in kind of a short period of time, uh, you know, uh, going over medical services and new home prices, so. That is a lot. So what are the benefits of using OER in the classroom? Um, there's benefits for students and faculty. So for students, it's reduced textbook costs. So if you know, you're know you using um, an OER in the classroom instead of a textbook, that eliminates a cost for them. Um, accessibility, because of the nature of OER and being able to edit and change it, you can uh, make OER more accessible, you can translate it, you can add closed captionings if you want to, or maybe uh, there's a slideshow that you really like with an open license and you notice that the color scheme might not be uh, accessible for people with different uh, visual abilities. That is something that you can change about it. Um, it's also an opportunity um, for equity inclusion in that, you know, we have the aspect of it, uh, it impacting students who might have some financial burdens. It uh, relieves them of that financial burden. But also, again, because of the nature of OER, you can do things like take something that has, you know, only images of a certain type of uh, person or a certain type of group and change that. You can add different openly sourced images to have a more diverse work. And then student success, as we saw the numbers before, um, when students don't have the access to their uh, educational materials that they need on day one, uh, then they are less likely to succeed in the class. So some of the benefits for faculty include customization of materials, um, you know, being able to change things about it, being able to add their own take or, you know, remixing some of that. Um, you can also find things to fit your teaching style and needs there's a lot of flexibility. And again, it provides students better access so that you know that they have access on day one. So just a couple of OER myths. Um, one is that open educational resources are low quality materials because anyone can make them. While anyone can add a CC license to um, an educational material that they make, um, OER, is not something that uh, people in education take lightly. There are a lot of repositories where um, the uh, OER textbooks are peer reviewed. Um, a lot of folks go through that peer review process or have others review their resources when they create them. And again, because of its nature, if there is something that you find that you don't like about an OER, if you're able to make changes to it, then you can actually fix it. Um, so uh, a lot of money goes into the creation of OER, which kind of goes into, you know, OER not being sustainable as a myth, uh, just to jump to that one real quick. You know, it's the idea is that uh, because people aren't getting paid to make these things that OER will not continue to exist. But that's not necessarily true because a lot of funding does go into OER and a lot of people just do it. Like when I made the slides for that presentation, I wasn't getting paid to do that, but I just made it openly licensed just in case anybody wanted to use it. And that happens quite often in academia. Um, so in terms of OER furthering the digital divide, one of the big, uh, values of OER is accessibility and making things as easily accessible as possible. So that includes 
thinking of OER beyond, you know, just the textbook, like I mentioned, something that could be an OER is just a worksheet that a teacher might use. And maybe even in like a K through 12, you know, setting where they, uh, they find a worksheet online, they can easily print it and send it home with students. Um, so it's, it's important to remember that OER is not just uh, digital resources, that it can have a, a print component too. And although print might not always be free, it usually uh, is cheaper. Um, and then uh, one of the myths being OER has a negative impact on intellectual property and profits of an author. Um, this is uh, a myth because uh, the author chooses to do this. This is a choice that they've made to, uh, to make their work open. So nobody's really forcing them to do it. Um, in addition to that, uh, similar to open access, if more people have access to your work, it could be an opportunity for your, for your work to be seen by more people. Um, and then we touched on the sustainability of OER, but I also just want to mention again, you know, if it does exist um, in a digital format, being able to easily uh, edit it or uh, revise it as new information comes along is a great thing about OER uh, in that you can do that, uh, making it more sustainable in terms of uh, content. Um, and then finally, a myth is that OER is always the best choice, and that's not necessarily true. It is a choice, and there are times when traditional copyright makes more sense. So just some OER considerations for faculty. Um, before you decide if you want to create OER or use an OER through, that you find through a repository, some things you might want to ask yourself are, you know, does the OER you need already exist? Am I going to be reinventing the wheel if I try to make a you know, whole new thing? Um, what types of formats are you looking for? Do you want modules? Do you want videos? What do you want? Um, what accessibility issues need to be addressed? How will you host the OER? Where will it live? And what support will you need to adapt, edit, or create new OER? Great. Thanks, Melody. And Sam, did we have a question in the chat? Yeah. We did. Um, I'll just read it out loud from Alyssa. Do you know if there is a way independent OA journals can get their journal indexed by those major databases? I'm thinking about smaller self-published or organization published journals, not published by a big publisher. Yeah, that's a good question. It is definitely harder for smaller journals that are not part of um, larger academic publishers. There are some opportunities. I think it varies how this happens. Sometimes a publisher may reach out or a, an indexer may reach out to the journal individually and say, we like, we wanna get your content into our index. Here is what you need to do. And in some cases there's, there, there's gonna be a barrier there in terms of the metadata with and how much work it is and metadata knowledge it takes for that journal to, to create the sheets that are needed to share that data. So with some of those journals, you may just see them doing like article level or uh, title level metadata and not like full article text that's going into those indexes. Um, some journals that I've worked with, they've really kind of struggled when it's come to trying to get into those indexes. Um, so sometimes journals end up paying for this kind of work for somebody to do that indexing metadata for them so they can get into those indexes. I think that really can be a barrier for those smaller journals, unfortunately. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, so how can the libraries help with OA and OER? We can do a lot of things. With open access, we can help evaluating publication venues, we can help with finding funding to support article processing charges, and we can help share open access scholarship that has been published elsewhere. And um, the libraries can help with OER by helping find existing OER through open repositories, um, funding the use of OER in the classroom through OER and textbook affordability grants that we offer and support for creating, adapting, or remixing OER. Awesome. So I'm going to quickly go through some of the things, how we can help with some of these OA things. With evaluating, we can and do do presentations that 
on just this topic alone. So there's a lot you can say about evaluating journals and resources to help with this. One of the sites that we like, a non-UNCG site is called Think, Check, Submit. So it walks you through a checklist to help evaluate uh, your journal or publication venue that you're considering. There's also a very detailed rubric called Journal Evaluation Tool. It's shared openly. It was created by librarians at Loyola Marymount, one of whom actually used to work here at UNCG. So if you want a really detailed look at considerations for uh, journals that you're thinking about, then you may wanna look at that. And then I've got some links here for slides and recordings for some recent presentations that we've done related to this topic about uh, recognizing and avoiding predatory journals, choosing the right journal for your needs, and what happens if a predatory journal reaches out to you. Um, so those are all available if you're interested in looking at the slides or in watching them. And if you need help evaluating a journal, a publisher, or a conference, please ask. All the academic departments have an assigned liaison librarian, and they are your first point of contact generally. They're a great person to reach out to. You can also reach out to me um, or to both of us um, if you'd like to get some second opinions on a journal or publisher um, or conference that might potentially be predatory or might be okay to publish it. With funding, we are glad to offer the Open Access Publishing Fund. We've recently raised the award amount to $1,500. So an individual is eligible to apply and receive one of these a year. Um, you have to go through an application process and you're eligible if you are full-time faculty, full-time EHRA employees, or enrolled graduate students. There's an online application form and more information on our LibGuide. And we also work directly with some academic publishers to offer discounts and credits that can help with funding. So the best deal we've got right now is with Cambridge University Press, unlimited APC waivers. So if you're publishing with Cambridge and you want to publish your work openly, you can do that for free. We have a 10% discount with Sage. We have a limited number of APC waivers with IGI Global. Those can also be used for book chapters. Um, with, with MDPI, we have a 10% discount. And coming very soon, we have a deal for additional APC waivers with Wiley. If you'd like to learn more about any of these, um, or at least the first four, they are on our guide. The Wiley information will be available when uh, that goes live. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And it is possible in certain situations to combine those publisher discounts and OA publishing fund monies. So if you're say accepted for a Sage article, you could use that 10% discount and still apply for the OA publishing fund um, to receive up to $1,500, depending on the amount of your uh, uh, article processing charge. So keep this in mind as well. And we would love it if y'all would share the word about this stuff so that we can uh, let people know who need this funding. And if you have ended up using any of these funding options, uh, especially with the publishers, um, reach out and let us know about your experience. We love to have some feedback so we can inform decisions about the future. And this one's for Melody. Yeah, so some OER funding options. So the UNCG libraries in partnership with the Provost's office have been supporting um, OER or textbook affordability grants since 2015. Um, so faculty are awarded um, a thousand dollar stipend for replacing a textbook in their class with OER or a free resource provided by the library. So things like articles through a subscription, um, all access eBooks and so on. Um, so future funding for their grants related to OER will um, also include more financial uh, incentives. So this is something that we're working on right now. It's still in the works, but um, we are actually adding more uh, funds to um, textbook affordability for students. Um, and, you know, uh, since the OER mini grants have um, have been in place since 2015, we have been able to save students over $3 million. So it has a high uh, return on investment impact. That's awesome, $3 million, that's a big difference. All right, so sharing. 
if you want to share your scholarship openly, but you're working with a publisher that where you can't afford the APC or they don't work with us, so there's no waiver or discount, you can still publish wherever you like and consider sharing your work through NC Docs, our open access database. So this is an example of a profile for Nora Bird in Library and Information Studies. We've got a little bit of information about her. And when we scroll down, links to some of her publications that take us to open access versions. So the materials in NC Docs are available to anyone, anywhere. And so this provides a stable long-term platform and a profile for sharing your scholarship. It shows download counts. And if there are uh, funding or granting agency requirements for your work to be publicly available, then this may be able to assist you with that and fulfill those requirements. It's very easy to get or update a profile. We have a dedicated email address, ncdocs at uncg.edu. You can send us copies of articles or other scholarship. You can send your CV or just a list of publications. And we take care of the rest, including checking the publisher copyrights and sharing permissions. We can't add everything to NC Docs. We do have to make sure that we can get permission. So sometimes there are copyright restrictions that do prevent us, but we will take care of checking that and letting you know what the situation is. Um, so we're wrapping up here. If you need a reminder on any of these topics, or if you want a session about any of these topics for your department or course, we would be glad to assist. Just reach out to us. Um, and we'd love to answer any questions. So if you've got them, feel free to unmute or um, type in the chat. We've also got a slide with our contact information, a link to the slides. And at the very end, there's a list of acronyms from the presentation in case you need a reminder about any of that. So uh, while, while people are potentially typing, I wanna say thanks to Sam for running these uh, professional development webinars and thanks to all of y'all for being here. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks y'all. So are there any questions? Uh, Joe said, this is great. A couple of people have said, that's so cool. When you mentioned the $3 million savings, Melody. Um, I'm redropping some links in the chat to the slides and to where the webinars live. And that's it. Um, any other final questions? I think a lot of people here who are here are kind of pros when it I comes to, to OA and OER, uh, but we appreciate the support audience. and y'all being here. Because um, I know Sam said there were some people who signed up who wanted the recording, so we're glad to be able to so do the that for them. will be had by all. Yeah. Um, they're always helpful. Uh, Alyssa said, I did learn some things. Yes, me too. Me as well. It's always good to, good to get to hear what others are working on. So I appreciate getting some of the updated details from Melody about OER. It's awesome. We're doing so much in that area. Well, thanks, y'all. Um, I'll see many of you, I'm sure, around the, the um, library this week. And um, if not, happy holidays. And uh, thanks, y'all, again, uh, Anna and Melody, particularly for hosting or for presenting, hosting, and presenting. Um, so thanks y'all. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Y'all take care. See you later.